Welcome back. A few videos ago, I finished my uh, dual electronic engine control lever IP68 uh, car to the playlist here, link in the description. And uh, this is all good, so I can now go <coughs> forward and backward. But wouldn't it be nice if we could also <coughs> somehow change direction? And this need for directional control, not the need for speed, brought about this latest electronic steering wheel slash jock IP68 of course project. In this video we will talk about the requirements for such a steering wheel slash jog and this will <laughs> take us down memory lane uh, to the history of marine steering mechanisms as well as some uh, yeah, uh, force measurement sessions. Uh, yeah, by the way <clears throat> The details of this special <laughs> wheel, uh, steering wheel I have here will be featured in some future mailbag video. Anyway, enjoy! So what are our ad hoc or naive requirements if we would just brainstorm? Of course, we need an electronic interface. It's in the name and it will be an I2C, SPI or UART or some other short distance electronic interface. Yeah, here in uh, that contraption we have an I2C interface. The user interface, uh, that is the wheel itself, should be of course a multi-turn. I mean, if you've ever driven a car, uh, yeah, you have, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> several turns to go from extreme left uh, to extreme right, okay? So yeah, and if you are ever piloted a small boat or a sailing boat, motorboat, doesn't matter, that featured some kind of steering wheel, that is also multi-turn. So uh, yeah, these things are obviously uh, multi-turn. And <clears throat> also it should be <laughs> repeatable and have a fixed uh, zero position. That is uh, one position of the wheel should exactly correspond, correspond to one position in your steering. Finally, some mechanical requirements. It should withstand reasonable forces. And here we have to talk a little bit about the context. So I intend to use that wheel in a small dinghy or john boat. Uh, so yeah, uh, one or two persons, uh, nothing fancy, okay. And of course, also in the name, it should be IP68 watertight. However, while electronic interface and IP68 watertight are a given, does it really have to be multi-turn? Uh, yeah, uh, constructing a multi-turn venal is a pain in the ass and does it bring us really some advantages? And uh, then repeatable a fixed zero position. Yeah, if you ever played a, a racing game at an arcade, um, <clears throat> There's nothing like repeatability or fixed zero position. And then, of course, the big questions, what is reasonable force? To answer the question for myself, if I really want, respectively, need a multi-turn wheel, I went back in time and revisited the development of marine steering mechanisms. And that's exactly what we will do now. Little disclaimer here, I'm not a marine historian. I'm just looking at that thing from one perspective only and that's multi-turn or not multi-turn, okay? In the beginning, there was actually no rudder here at the end of a boat, 
but instead you had here a special kind of ore at one side which you used to control the direction your boat was going and this special um, let's call it steering ore uh, could have been attached uh, with some contraption here at the end at, uh, to the boat or not anyway uh, this technique is to the day used in open canoes where you use some uh, some special steering strokes to steer your open canoe to the to port or to starboard and now i'm going on a tangent whenever you moored your boat in a port to a kai you did that on the side that <laughs> is not the side with your steering oar because otherwise <clears throat> you would have crushed your steering oar or it would have at least gotten into the way. So since these days we call the side where the steering oar is not and which is moored to the port, the port side. Okay? And that's traditionally the left side. And the other side where the oar is, the steering oar, we call starboard. Because the person piloting the boat, steering it with the steering oar, was constantly staring at the stars uh, for navigational purposes. So starboard. Makes absolutely sense. Uh, um, I totally made that up right now. Anyway, in German, that side of the boat, the right hand side, is called Steuerbord, which translates roughly, uh, uh, more appropriately, as steering board. Okay, so this uh, port uh, starboard makes much more sense in German than it does in English. But anyway. The point I really wanted to make here is that this is a lever and that's the fulcrum of the lever and that gives you some mechanical advantage when operating that steering oar yeah, against the hydrodynamic forces exerted on your oar blade. After that starboard port thing was well established, there was no longer a need to have a steering oar here to actually mark the starboard side. Also, the guy standing here at the starboard side was constantly getting wet from the waves and the spray coming up here. So people finally moved the whole thing into the center line of the boat and so the rudder tiller combo we know today was invented. The rudder and tiller solution had two more advantages. First, you were now able to moor the boat on both sides to a kai without any problems. And second, a rudder is hydrodynamically more efficient in changing the direction of a boat at least as long as there is some water current flowing over the rudder. Anyway, the tiller is of course again a lever and we have a fulcrum here giving you a mechanical advantage against the hydrodynamic forces on your rudder. And now I'm going on a little tangent again, because there are other ways to reduce the hydrodynamic forces on your rudder. I mean, uh, first of all, we have also here quite a lever, not at long, as long as that one, but quite a lever out here to the center of the rudder. So that can be shortened. So our fulcrum or our axis of rotation is now right here at the front edge of the rudder. So there is really only a minimal lever here. Yeah, if we look at the center line of the rudder and a really long lever here. But we can do one better. 
If we move the center of rotation to the hydrodynamic center of the rudder, we can almost eliminate completely the forces necessary for moving the rudder. That's called a balanced rudder then. And if we're going out not that far, but stay somewhere here in the middle, that's a semi-balanced rudder and you still need some force yeah, to actuate it. But this solution has the advantage that it's self-centering. So as soon as we let go of the tiller, as long as there is some current here, the rudder will self-center. Here's a very simplified explanation of how that balanced rudder thing works. And yes, I'm aware that a rudder at the end of the day works like a wing and things are much more complicated with high pressure zones and low pressure zones. But anyway, so the water flow is going in this direction and we have our rudder here, our balanced rudder at some angle. So the water coming on here is pressing on uh, in the picture, the top half of the rudder and trying to turn it into this direction. While the other part here of our water flow is pressing against the lower part of the rudder and trying to turn it into this direction. And these two moments torques, ideally in a perfectly balanced rudder, would cancel each other out. In a semi-balanced rudder, the center of rotation would be further up here. So this moment would be smaller and on that moment would be greater. And so the forces would cancel out each other only partially. The tiller rudder combo is used to this day. Often the rudder has been replaced by an output motor by now, but the principle is the same. Even larger sailing vessels still use rudder and tiller, which is quite astounding to me. But as time went by, most people started to view the rudder and tiller mechanism as uncool. And so they invented the steering wheel. In the beginning, this was just the wheel connected via a rope around its shaft or some pulleys here and more pulleys to a smaller version of a tiller at the back. And the real reason for all this effort was of course to enable you to move your steering position away from where the rudder is. Yeah, to a more convenient place. The important point here, at least from my perspective, is again that this pulley here has a very small diameter. So it takes several turns of the wheel to get from hard uh, port we are now to hard starboard, giving you again a mechanical advantage. So multi-turn wheel equals mechanical advantage. Over time, these ropes have been replaced by steel cables and at least in the case of smaller boats by Bowden wires. And the Bowden wires, of course, eliminated uh, the need for all these pulleys here. For larger boats, Bowden wires are not strong enough Instead, you are using a hydraulic system. So your wheel is actuating a hydraulic pump, which in turn over two hydraulic lines is actuating a hydraulic cylinder here, which moves your rudder. It took me a while to get here, sorry. But anyway, multi-turn is historically really just there to have a mechanical advantage. And if you have ever driven a car without power steering, you know what I'm talking about. Especially when you're trying to get your car into a parking spot without power steering, you need a lot of force on that steering wheel. But anyway, uh, 
the mechanical advantage is not required for electronic steering system because there <coughs> some servo mechanism will produce all the force and you just have to turn the wheel to a specific position. So in the end this is not really a requirement for our electronic steering wheel. But maybe there's another reason for multi-turn. What about steering precision? I mean, it's a difference if I have a steering wheel and I turn that, uh, th let's say, 30 degrees and in turn my rudder only moves 10 degrees or so. I have a much finer control. But if you look at real world examples, that's also really not required. I mean, uh, think about a little race cart or your, <clears throat> uh, if you ever had one, bobby cart or go kart or Formula One cars or planes. <laughs> they don't have uh, multi turn horns or wheels, and you can still. Uh, yeah, navigate them <clears throat> very precisely. So I guess we can rule out multi-turn as a requirement. And indeed, if you look at the helm positions of uh, modern boats and ships, yeah, the larger ones, you often don't find any more uh, wheel. Uh, there is no wheel. Instead, there is something like this, which is called a follow-up jog control. And you simply move the lever there to uh, move your rudder. And the rest is done um, by some electronics. I personally find the <clears throat> lever variant a little bit unintuitive, especially when you are in a very low seated uh, position in a dinghy or a little John boat. Uh, so I will probably go for something like this here where you still have some kind of wheel but uh, yeah the rotation of the wheel the angle directly corresponds one to one to the movement of your rudder. Now that we eliminated the multi-turn from our requirement list, what about repeatability and a fixed zero position? Let's consider a hydraulic steering system for a little bit larger boat with uh, two steering positions. One on the flybridge and the second one in the cabin. The steering wheels in that case actuate hydraulic pumps, which in turn over hydraulic lines actuate some hydraulic cylinder, which in turn moves our rudder or our outboard motor. These hydraulic pumps usually work in a way that uh, they create a pressure in one direction or another if you turn a wheel, but if an outside pressure is applied, they don't turn the wheel, okay? So they don't let any hydraulic fluid pass. That's important because otherwise if you would turn one wheel all the hydraulic pressure would just turn the other wheel and not actuate your hydraulic cylinder. So if we move one of the wheels we actually change our rudder position uh, respectively the uh, angle of our outboard motor but the other wheel doesn't move meaning there is no repeatability or a fixed position on these wheels in such a hydraulic system. To overcome that problem, there's usually some measurement unit here measuring your rudder position or your motor position. And then you have two rudder position, motor position, indicators here at the helm stations. Now, in my little John boat, I won't have a second steering position and I don't want to add complexity by needing to have a rudder position or motor position indicator. So, yes, I want repeatability and a fixed zero position for my electronic steering wheel. That leaves us, at least for today, with the question, what are reasonable forces? So we have to do some measurements and uh, find out uh, 
<clears throat> how strong I am. So I'm sitting here at about, oh, something's wrong? No. Uh -uh. This is actually quite hard to film, uh, if you believe it. Okay, I'm pulling now down as hard as I can in this uh, awkward position. Without breaking something. And I already have no idea. Oh, we measured nothing. That's good. Let's try that again. Okay. Nothing. Huh. Ah, okay. Uh, it. <clears throat> I see where the problem is. Uh, so I won't <laughs> see the results before I have looked at the footage. Uh, if I'm still in frame. I am in frame now. Okay. Um, yeah. But anyway, uh, 35 centimeters, that's about the seating height. Uh, in a dinghy, sometimes it's lower, only 30 centimeters or so. And yeah, that would be the most natural position. Next measurement. Next measurement, I'm only pulling down with one hand. That will give us hopefully, after some calculations, the torque. And I have to reset here. Uh, <laughs> okay, this time I'm pulling up the whole contraption and I cannot place the second camera anywhere. So you have just to believe me. So, not... <sighs> yeah, I can't get... Okay, I'm standing on my feet now, but... <clears throat> yeah, let's say... 9 kilograms. And, of course, pulling upwards with uh, both hands. Okay. Don't get on your feet. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm standing here on my feet, which... Oh, you could do that. It's 20. But 20 is painful, at least for me. Okay. <clears throat> How much do you think I can pull on this contraption. Let's see. Hello? Zero. And... Oh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, ah, uh, 15. I'm, I'm, I'm sliding here. Okay. Okay, the last test. How much can I push this contraption. This will be probably quite a lot. We will see. Okay, if I lean in it... Okay, I'm sliding again, but let's say 10 kilos. Huh. That's not that much, is it? Okay, almost forgot one measurement here. That is the sideways force. That a picture, yep. Let's try this. <clears throat> but <laughs> 
I'm I'm sliding. I'm sliding. So yeah, I hope I captured that. Oh, we will see. And here are the results. So I was able to pull down my wheel with 21 kilograms, which is about uh, 210 newtons. I simply multiplied by 10 and not by 9.81 uh, to be on the safe side. And I was able to pull up with 20 kilograms, so 200 newtons, and to the sides. I measured only one side uh, with 10 kilograms, about 100 newtons. Now, for the turning moment I'm able to apply. I was able to pull down on one side with 12 kilograms, 120 newtons, or up here on the other side, nine kilograms, 90 newtons. And my lever on each side, total diameter of the wheel is 0.25 meters, is 0.125 meters. And if you add that up, so uh, multiply the forces by the length of the lever and add that up, you come to 26.25 Newton meters moment I can apply or <laughs> which I eventually have to stop at one point. And finally, I can pull out of the out of the whole assembly the wheel with about 15 kilograms 150 newtons and i am able to push it in with 10 kilograms and 100 newtons and so i have answered the question so what are reasonable forces and we have no longer just some ad hoc and naive requirements but these are our final requirements for our electronic steering wheel IP68. And that's it for today. Uh, next up for this project would probably be some static calculations to see what it takes to <clears throat> handle all these forces here. But maybe I start in parallel another project which is a little bit more on the electronic side. We'll see. Till then, bye.